When Soviet academics and politicians first began to seriously consider automated planning in the early 1960s, the CIA established a special branch to study what it perceived to be a significant threat. President Kennedy's top aide warned that Soviet progress in cybernetics would result in a tremendous advantage, pushing the Soviet economy far ahead of its American competitor. Soviet cybernetics experts themselves expected major gains, anticipating a net positive effect from automation within just 15 years of implementation. Why, then, did an automated planned economy never materialize in the Soviet Union? To answer this question, we will first follow the timeline of Soviet cybernetics from its inception to its eventual decline. Then we will review the obstacles faced by the proponents of automation. First, what exactly is cybernetics? The term generally refers to systems that make use of feedback loops, which help adapt to and evolve from external changes. Such systems may manifest in many spheres, including the biological, ecological, social, and cognitive. Cybernetics is therefore an interdisciplinary field with many possible applications. Cybernetics in the USSR had an uneasy start in the post-war years. Initial resistance to the ideas of cybernetics were grounded primarily in anti-American sentiments, given the field's American origins. Despite this, Norbert Weiner, the American mathematician credited with the founding of cybernetics, went on to be a celebrated figure in Soviet scientific circles throughout the decades of the Cold War. Benjamin Peters argues that anti-cybernetics rhetoric was not ideological, adding that even in the Stalin era, the sciences were far less constricted than is usually claimed by Sovietologists. Many Soviet scientists successfully employed dialectical materialism as a genuine source of inspiration, not a forced ideology, in their scientific work. The reality that the health of science depended more on funding than it did on freedom also sobers reflection on the contemporary state of science and public attitudes about it. Preliminary efforts to rehabilitate cybernetics were spearheaded by Anatoly Kitov with the help of two prominent scientists, Sergei Sobolev and Alexei Lupinov. Eventually, proponents were able to make the case for a socialist cybernetics, in large part by linking it to the struggle for raising productivity and hence liberating the masses from the burdens of labor. Even as cybernetics came to be viewed as a tool for socialist development, disagreements about its exact characteristics persisted in academic circles. The monumental mathematician Andrei Kolmogorov sought to define cybernetics as an information science. Meanwhile, other conceptualizations associated the field with probabilistic causal networks, set theory, and algebraic logic. Following Kitov, the most notable figure in Soviet cybernetics was Viktor Glushkov. Glushkov was an exceptionally talented and hardworking scientist whose tenacious lobbying got the automated planning agenda on the desks of the highest-ranking political officials in his time. Glushkov helped found and direct the Institute of Cybernetics, established on the outskirts of Kyiv. This Cybertonia became a prolific enclave of scientists working on computerization, automation, and general issues of cybernetics. By this time, cybernetics had not only been rehabilitated, but was enjoying substantial attention from policymakers and a number of ministries. Interest in cybernetics persisted for the rest of Soviet history, although the vision of a nationwide automated system never truly came to fruition. Before we explore what stunted the growth of cybernetics in the USSR, Let's consider what the various proposals looked like. How would automated planning have functioned? What exactly would automation have offered the Soviet economy? As industrialization expanded the size and complexity of the Soviet economy, planning became exponentially more complicated. Allocating resources efficiently for thousands of distinct commodities is an immense computational challenge, and doing so optimally across an extended time frame only amplifies the challenge. By 1962, some 3 million Soviet citizens were employed for the purposes of calculating and logging production data. The computational burden was explosive. In this sense, computerization and digitization alone could have substantially alleviated the burden of calculation. Interest in cybernetics mounted during an era of economic reform. Contending with the cybernetic school was a school of so-called liberal reformers, who sought to introduce profit measures for local enterprises while holding on to national planning principles. 
Rather than introducing various elements of market economics, the cyberneticists envisioned a technocratic reform capable of elevating socialist planning to the degree of complexity of a modern economy. Peters offers a lucid contrast between the cyberneticists and the liberal reformers. The economic cyberneticists championed what might be called planometrics, or a combination and application of econometric mathematical tools that included input-output models, not dissimilar from planned supply and demand, linear programming, and sophisticated statistics to the problem of economic planning. Like the liberal reformers, the economic mathematicians, cyberneticists, and econometrists comprising this loose camp conceived of the command economy as a vast information coordination problem. Unlike the liberal economists, however, the cyberneticists were less concerned with reducing the complexity of the economy understood as an information system to a single golden index, profits. The first blueprints for automated planning were drawn up by early cybernetics advocate Anatoly Kitov. Kitov's Economic Automatic Management Systems, EASU, appears to predate any other Soviet efforts to establish civilian computer networks. Noting the existing network of computers utilized by the Soviet military, Kitov suggests upgrading the system such that the computers could take on economic optimization problems. The largely underground military computer network was well protected and already extensive. It was merely a matter of appending a parallel civilian network that would allow various organizations to access above-ground terminals for the purposes of exchanging digital information across large distances and short time periods. But Kitov's proposal, which was particularly critical of the military structures, never reached the desks of the upper leadership. Peters argues that the military top brass intercepted Kitov's efforts to appeal to the Politburo in large part out of the lack of willingness to share computing resources with the civilian sector. This intersectoral fighting may have been one of the obstacles for automated planning in the USSR. An automated computer network threatened to automate and jeopardize the Ministry of Defense's positions of power over strategic bottlenecks of resources in information technology, granting civilian economic planners access to the ministry's technological monopoly. Viktor Glushkov's all-state automated system for computation and information processing was the most famous iteration of the cybernetic vision. Ogas, as it came to be known, was meant to be a smart network whose decentralized command and control protocols would be capable of automating, mathematically modeling, optimizing, and rationalizing away the profound inefficiencies that beset the command economy. How would Ogas have worked? It would have been an integrated system of nodes, the smallest of which would have been individual production facilities, whose computers would have had direct, real-time information regarding output, efficiency, and other relevant variables. Such workplace nodes would have fed into regional decision-making centers that received information from other nodes and communicated with them accordingly. Above the regional centers would have been the main node, situated in Moscow. In short, the system was designed to have three distinct layers. Importantly, access throughout the system was designed not only to be vertical, but horizontal as well. In other words, authorized users would have had real-time access to information in any node within the system. This decentralized remote computing was in effect a direct predecessor to what we now know as cloud computing. Moreover, information was not limited to matrices of numbers. Data could have taken qualitative forms as well, such as worker reports and suggestions for improving production or workplace efficiency. Peters writes the following regarding the system's organizational nature. Although still hierarchical, acquiescent to Moscow as the center and state-led, the longest-lasting Soviet network proposal was openly worker-oriented, anti-bureaucratic, and decentralizing in principle. Costs were obviously a concern, given that Glushkov's proposal envisioned nothing short of creating a national nervous system, implementation would have required substantial physical and monetary resources. Nevertheless, the claim made by its proponents was that Ogas would pay for itself many times over after the initial investment was laid out. Unlike its American counterpart, known as ARPANET, Ogas would have been set up as a kind of nervous system. Peters argues that ARPANET resembled the brain with a decentralized body of users. Ogas's hierarchy reflected a nervous system, with Moscow as the brain and the entire nation as a single incorporated body of workers. Furthermore, Glushkov strongly believed in developing a universal mathematical language for the automated system. He favored deriving general models, rules, and mathematical abstractions that could then be applied broadly and adjusted to specific circumstances. 
The sentiment was to act locally while thinking globally. In tandem with Agass, the establishment of the Central Economic Mathematical Institute, CEMI, was designed to mathematically formalize optimal planning. The idea was that, together, CEMI's work in mathematical methods and Ogas's innovations in cybernetics theory could serve as pillars for an automated Soviet economy. Unfortunately, CEMI drifted away from Ogas as developing fine-grained microeconomic models proved to be more immediately rewarding and less politically risky. Given the strong desire among academics and politicians alike to see automation through, what exactly went wrong? It should be no great surprise that the obstacles were multifaceted. The most obvious frictions were naturally political. When the August proposal was finally put forth to the Politburo on October 1, 1970, two key figures were absent, Brezhnev and Kasigin. Incidentally, the two most powerful individuals in the Politburo who were also the most likely to support Ogas, were not present to make a case for Glushkov's vision. In Brezhnev and Kasigin's absence, the Minister of Finance, Vasily Garbuzov, managed to turn the meeting against Ogas, advocating instead for a limited and technical application of computer systems. Some of the greatest opposition came from the Central Statistical Administration, the CSA, headed by Vladimir Starovsky. Starovsky was concerned about Ogas rendering the functions of the CSA obsolete, given its remote access data input and processing. The CSA did not object in principle to computerization, but rather hoped to shape the computerization process to its own needs. A number of officials objected to fixing computerization under the wing of the CSA, citing the scope of the project and contending that computerization was far from an exclusively statistical upgrade. Peter's thesis suggests that computerized automation failed in the Soviet Union because socialists behaved like capitalists, whereas the success of the internet in the West was due largely to capitalists behaving like socialists. The American ARPANET developed out of a primarily centralized effort, headed by the Department of Defense, sidestepping most of the coordination problems faced by its Soviet analog. Ironically, it was divisions between ministries and bureaucratic agencies in the Soviet state apparatus that brought cybernetic projects to a grinding stop. Trachtenberg anticipates much of Peter's analysis, suggesting that Glushkov's primary obstacles were bureaucratic in nature, and that the hierarchical design of Agas fundamentally conflicted with the de facto heterarchical organization of the Soviet economy. In a different tone, Safronov argues that computerization was actually never rejected or defeated, but rather variously reinterpreted by competing agencies who envisioned distinct roles for computer technologies in the planned economy. In this sense, Safronov contends that there was never a lack of interest in computerization, but an overabundance of enthusiasm. Each agency and bureaucratic wing pictured itself at the head of the computerization windfall, in so doing, the ministries and agencies operated more like capitalists, competing against each other to maximize economic gains. Even as Ogas faced obstacles, the battle to establish nationwide computerization continued as Gosplan, the state planning agency, pivoted to constructing localized automated systems of management, ASUs, in the hopes of a later systematization of nodes. The Gosplan Initiative Automated System of Planning Calculations, ASPR, was meant to be a precursor and compromise to Ogas. The existence and implementation of the ASPR suggests that computerization of the planned economy was never rejected wholesale. Despite Ogas's eventual political demise, the ASPR continued to be supported and expanded in various forms until the collapse of the USSR. One of the critical bottlenecks for the computerization of the economy was the actual production and standardization of computers. Production lagged behind demand, and the multiplicity of different models with prohibitive interoperability meant that the implementation of nationwide computer optimization programs was extremely challenging. To account for the uniformity issues, production shifted towards imitation of foreign technology. The reorientation towards replicating Western computing technology discouraged Soviet experts, who were hoping to promote their own visions and projects. In a more general sense, imitating imported technology definitionally doomed any chance of competition and therefore development of native industry. A 1965 CIA intelligence report estimated that only 40 computers were operating in Soviet production facilities in 1964. 
while nearly 5,000 computers were operating in the U.S. at the same time. Localized computerization spread slowly in the later period of the Soviet Union. By some liberal estimates, up to 6,900 computer systems were installed in individual enterprises between 1966 and 1984. Perhaps the biggest friction was the prohibitive costs of installation. At a cost of roughly $1 million, or $4 million in today's terms, computerization of workplaces was not widely affordable. Lastly, what Agas and adjacent projects offered was a rationalized, optimized, and centralized economic system. However, it might be said that the Soviet economy was not nearly as centralized as the cyberneticists pictured it being when they modeled their proposals. Peters argues that because the Ogas threatened to reorganize the social and economic spheres of life into the kind of rational plan system that the command economy imagined itself to be in principle, it threatened the very practice of Soviet economic life. Rather than being a hierarchy like the cyberneticists proposed, the real Soviet economy was heterarchical meaning there were a multitude of distinct hierarchies, ranging from ministries to agencies and institutes. Automation of the economy would have meant at once a centralization and a decentralization. On the one hand, a centralization of the logistical and decision-making flows. On the other hand, a localization of economic governance. The implication of Agas was as much sociopolitical as it was technical economic. The oft-referenced fully automated luxury communism did not materialize in the USSR for a number of reasons. Political infighting between the various hierarchies in the Soviet states stalled the development of cybernetics projects, both because existing planning bodies felt threatened by computerization and because automation represented an opportunity that each entity wanted to capture for itself. Though there were technical limitations, a computer technology sector could certainly have survived and thrived in the USSR had it received adequate support from the state. Lastly, the visions of Glushkov and others directly challenged the status quo. The mass digitization of information and the decentralization of communication, combined with instantaneous mathematical optimization of the economy, represented a radical transformation of existing structures. Still, to suggest that automation and the cybernetics projects of the Soviet era were failures is hyperbolic. Peters notes that Ogas and its predecessors should be remembered for their contributions to ongoing macro-level experiments in rational planning, administration, and policymaking in a world of global information networks. In many ways, these Soviet thinkers anticipated the interests of modern economists and laid the groundwork for what might be achieved in the future. Not only are technological constraints substantially looser in our day, but the translation to paperless and instantaneous information exchange has been totalizing. If the pioneers of Soviet cybernetics could confidently lay out blueprints for automated socialist planning half a century ago, the possibilities today are exponentially greater. The study of Soviet cybernetics is therefore not only a means of analyzing structural weaknesses in the Soviet system, but also a testament to just how much was actually achieved and how much more could be done in the coming decades.